Um, what, a, what an absolutely beautiful day in London. I know it's the sort of day that you'll want to spend in a lightless uh, room in a hotel. Um, so I'm going to try and make it as painless as possible. Um, there won't be a presentation to share with you afterwards. There is no presentation. There are no slides and, and panels and stuff. Um, I can provide you with one if that helps, because First Direct or people from First Direct do conferences on and off pretty much every year, and we don't have that many secrets. So you don't come knocking on our door if you want to find out what the leading technology in the banking industry is. I like to tell people that we're, uh, we are who we are in spite of our technology, not because of it. Um, I have the great privilege of leading it. I've done it now for a year and a half. And frankly, um, I learn more from First Direct than it's ever going to learn from me. Um, let me start by, uh, firstly, I'm going to read a speech today, because I know that, that irrespective of whether I got 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I generally ad-lib presentations, and that's disastrous if we're, run, if, if we're trying to run to a time scale. So I know that if I don't stick to the script, it's all going to go horribly wrong, so apologies. And one of the very best lessons I ever learned about presentations, years and years ago, and some of you I'm sure will know it, is that communication happens in a combination of three things, words, Music and dance. Have you heard it? It's a, little, it's a little rule. By far, the least important part of communicating are the words. Yeah? About 15%. Opinions vary. 10 to 15% of a message is actually uh, conveyed in the words. The rest, apparently, is in the sound of the voice, and it's in the movement of the speaker. So I'm going to hide behind this lectern, and then I'm going to terrify you by showing you that there's quite a lot of words. But panic not because I actually only have two ideas that I want to share with you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try and use some words to, to expand upon them, but they're two very simple ideas, and they're two ideas that I genuinely, genuinely believe in. One of them's an idea that I've been thinking about, you know, to call it developing for some time is to, is to perhaps give it a grandeur that it doesn't deserve. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, I think it was, who coined the phrase that simplicity is divinity. But uh, uh, an art director whom I used to work with put it differently uh, when he said that the art of the minimum requires the maximum discipline. And it rings true to me, and it certainly rings true of working in First Direct, because so often in our industry we appear to lose sight of the fact that the more complicated the front of a process, frankly, the more chances there are that that process is going to go wrong at some stage within the process, and therefore the more risk involved in every respect. And whereas once upon a time that risk might have crystallized in a poor customer service experience, in the industry we're all sitting in today, that is much more likely to crystallize in a mis-selling problem, which frankly is going to carry a damn sight bigger immediate risk to your business and hit to your bottom line than previously was the case. So doing things simply and simple ideas runs right to the heart of First Direct as a business. And um, I make a, a no apology for the fact that it also runs right to the heart of what I'm going to share with you this morning. Um, the first concerns brands, and the second concerns invention or innovation. And the first idea is epitomized in a statement that I heard from a very senior, uh, eminent almost, marketer about seven or eight years ago as he was leaving the marketing, the banking marketing sector and going back to agency land. He fled back across the Atlantic, having spent five or six years in the UK leading a, a major bank um, uh, marketing team. And he said, and I quote him, there are no brands left in banking except maybe First Direct, unquote. Um, I hadn't worked for First Direct at the time. I, I banked with it. I'd banked with First Direct since 1992, but frankly, I didn't know a great deal about the brand or about the organization. Um, I had, you know, been there for a fair few years, but, but frankly, knew very little about the business. <clears throat> but I was a marketer at the time, and I'm always going to be a marketer, let's be absolutely honest. I can't, I can't not be. And I probably should have understood what he meant. But it was some years later, and I'm talking five or six years later, that the true meaning of there are no brands left in banking except maybe First Direct began to resonate with me. And it wasn't a Damascene moment. It wasn't when I came back to First Direct, incidentally. Why, I thought, had such a respected and eminent figure in our industry made such a provocative statement, a provocative assertion? Um, I didn't understand them then, but I do understand them now. Of course there are no brands left in banking except maybe First Direct. It seems terribly obvious to me. Let me explain. I chose this morning to wear a grey suit. 
we don't have a dress code in, in First Direct. And generally, if I do conferences, I dress as I might in First Direct. But I chose to be uh, one of those men in grey suits this morning, especially for you. Um, and I want you to consider three very, very simple questions about the grey suit, right? Firstly, how much might you think it costs to make? Uh, how much do you think it costs to buy? And then maybe most importantly of all, how much do you think it's worth? Because it's a grey suit. It's a pretty unremarkable, standard issue garment in business circles. Can anyone tell me how much it costs to make? No. I, yeah, I have no idea how much it costs to make, and frankly, I'm never going to go and find out, to be honest with you. I can tell you how much it costs to buy, but I'm not going to. Can any of you guess, looking at the suit, how much it costs to buy? Hundreds, it, of pounds. hundreds of pounds. It could be hundreds of pounds, but the truth is, it's very difficult, isn't it? Simply by looking at the suit to tell me how much this costs to buy. How much is it worth, ladies and gentlemen? That depends on whether you have to take it off. Um, <laughs> I want you to consider two types of value, two very simple types of value. And you've all sort of read the textbooks and been to business schools and all sorts of things. And one is the value, if you like, in the seller's value. And I know that there's a value in a supply chain, but just simplify it and collapse it down. The value in, in, the sale, in the sale, and then there's the value in the purchase. What value from the purchase did the consumer get? And a lot of us can understand and a lot of us spend a lot of time when it comes to branding, understanding the value of a brand as expressed in the premium price that it commands. Yeah, it's this intangible premium price that you can monetize and you can add it to the cost of the garment or the cost of the item and, and, and make more money. That's what the whole point of a brand really is at some level commercially. But I want you to think about the thing that we don't think an awful lot about, which is the value of the brand in the consumer's life. That's a worth that you don't see. And it stands to reason, it's so very simple, that it must be worth more to me than what I paid for it. It must be, or else there's no profit in the purchase. Is that a fair statement? A statement? So somehow or the other, I mean, they may have saw me coming, let's be honest, but nonetheless, this is a gray suit. What do you think the price range of gray suits might run from? Shout out, just guess. 50 quid to 3,000, 5,000. Isn't that interesting? So let me ask you another question. How much of the value of the garment is contained in the brand? Do we think more than 50% of the value of the garment is contained in the brand? Doesn't it just? But let's just assume that this is a good gray suit. Opinions will vary. <laughs> yeah. So it's more than 50. Is it more than 60%? Is it more than 80%, do you think? Do you think they make Chanel number no. 5 by the gallon or by the tank? By the tank. So how much of the value? It's really interesting. Yeah? It's a gray suit. Do you know what brand it is? Can you tell? This, ladies and gentlemen, is an inner directed brand. I get to see it, but you don't. You don't get to see it unless I flash it. I could be a flasher this morning. <laughs> yeah, you catch a glimpse of it maybe if I take it off and hang it up. But other than that, I get to see it because I'm worth it. You see, it's not just the ladies who get to be that. It's an inner directed brand, and, it, and it, it, it really interests me, this gray suit, and I've been thinking, I know it's very sad to admit it, but I've been thinking a lot about what I was going to wear this morning. Because the more I thought about it, the more I thought, gee, how much are you willing to spend feeling good about yourself? And the answer is an awful lot of money. And that set me thinking about banking brands, because banking brands are kind of inner directed brands, are they not? Yeah? For the most part, the people who get to see them, who know what bank they're banking with, are you. Yeah? And you flash your card increasingly. <laughs> Frankly, you're not even going to do that. Let's just face it. You're just going to point your mobile device. But today, at least, you flash a card or a bit of plastic at a till. And in that moment, your brand is visible to other people. Yeah? Is that moment important? 
Isn't that interesting? There are no brands left in banking except maybe First Direct. Should that moment be important? Let me ask the question a different way. Don't hurry. How many of you have a bank brand in your wallet that says something intentional about you? One or two hands. Yeah? Isn't that what a brand is? Isn't that what it, it, doesn't a great brand make you feel good about yourself? So we're going to hear, I'm sure, a lot about the technicalities and about the detail of banking today. But for me, it starts at a very simple but, frankly, very fundamental place. That, that if the brand itself doesn't represent something about the customers who chose it, you've got a big, big problem in your industry. In fact, you've got a fundamental problem in your industry because your industry is chasing itself into oblivion and commoditization. I thought it was a fascinating little idea. And, and the reason that I, 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 I suppose I can talk about it from First Direct's point of view is that, at the very least, all of the customers who bank with First Direct chose to bank with First Direct. Every single one of them left a bank to join us. That is not true in our industry. There isn't a positive choice that the customer is making by way of choosing where they go to bank. And there should be. Because where there's a positive choice, there's likely, not guaranteed, but there's likely to be more of a relationship to discuss. So you see, I've left my script now. I've got to kind of find where I'm supposed to be back to. And that's the first idea. It's the first idea that if you want to have a new kind of bank, you're going to have to rediscover in our industry the power of branding and the power of brands. The second point this morning concerns customer orientation. Um, my observation is that the greatest brands in the world are the ones that are actually the most customer oriented. Um, they're the brands that are built on a deep, deep insight into the human condition. And they often, they're often expressed in alarmingly simple notes. Alarmingly simple notes, but again, remember that the art of the minimum requires the maximum discipline. And it's not something our industry is famous for. For reasons that I cannot remember, and this is to be honest with you, when I was thinking about suits, I was also thinking about vacuum cleaners. There's a story there somewhere. And in particular about Mr. Dyson's very clever invention, yeah, the, the, the bagless cyclone vacuum cleaner. Um, because I believe that inventors are inherently people watchers. They're inherently existentialists. They have to be. They stand outside themselves. And they see the world from the individual's point of view. They see the world truly from their intended customer's point of view. Yeah. You see, I may be wrong, but, but I don't think that Dyson invented his vacuum cleaner because he's a great engineer, although I'm pretty sure he is a great engineer. I think he invented his vacuum cleaner because he saw housewives and house husbands save money by reusing bags until those very same bags finally gave up the ghost and exploded in their living room. I'm pretty sure that he also saw people fiddle around with that plasticky thing that you used to pull across the top of the bag, if you're old enough to remember it, to break your fingernails. I'm pretty sure that he saw people switch on the Hoover as it inflated in cloud of dust. I'm pretty sure he saw all of the things that he was trying to solve before he used his engineering skills to solve them. It's so obvious to me, in a, in a way, that you can't invent it unless you know what problem you're solving. It's, it, it's not about making money. It's about solving a problem, it's, isn't it? Or at least I, I have to believe it is. If, if it isn't, then, you know, Ignore everything else I have to say to you this morning. Um, I remember a few years back, and you know, all of you will have seen it or can see it on YouTube, uh, one of Steve Jobs' last product launches. And he talked about, he used the word humanistic and humanism uh, uh, in the context of, of Apple. 
And there was a lot of in industry commentators at the time who were thinking, you know, away with the fairies. That's where he is. Lost in show business. But he wasn't. He wasn't lost in show business at all. I absolutely believed that they're great not because of their technology, although God knows they've had some pretty whiz-bang people in that area. They're great because of their humanity. It's their humanity that drives their brand and drives the difference in that brand. I'm absolutely certain of it. And I heard Alex Ferguson once upon a time, not so long ago. I'm not a Man United supporter, but there you go. And he, he used a, a phrase which was really, really quite striking to me, which is players expressing themselves. Players expressing themselves. And when I first heard him, it seemed strange. But it's only strange until you think that an opera singer finds fulfillment in the song and in the singing. Well, it's obvious, isn't it, that a footballer is going to find fulfillment in the football and the feet. How many of you think about bringing your people to work so that they can express themselves? I mean, express them. They're professionals, aren't they? Aren't they? They are. So do we bring our people to work and create an environment wherein they can express themselves? where they can be who they want to be, express who they are, fulfill and realize themselves. Do you think? I've worked in a lot of different places. And First Direct's the only one that can lay claim to that, in, at least in my experience. To me, the extraordinary people, the most extraordinary people in the world, are the people who invent. And I'm not one of them, which is a bit devastating, but there you go. I get at least to earn a living talking about them. Um, they see the world differently. They absolutely do see the world differently. And, and this morning, I'm sure you're the same, you will have spent at least part of this morning tripping over somebody pulling a piece of luggage behind them. Now, I grew up in the 1970s, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out how we didn't figure out that sticking wheels and a handle on a suitcase was going to make life easier. But for 50 years, we didn't figure it out until a guy called Plath, who was an airline pilot, figured it out and became a millionaire in the process. Why didn't we figure it out? Because we weren't looking. Because we were living, but we weren't seeing. We weren't looking. Our industry doesn't look. Our industry doesn't look at itself from the customer's point of view. And it doesn't look at its customer's life. It's life, the things that are difficult from the customer's point of view. And that's why it doesn't invent. That's why it's a commoditized and commoditizing industry. That's, this is a gray suit. You would be appalled if I told you what I paid for the gray suit. Our industry doesn't have brands. It doesn't have brands and it doesn't invent because it doesn't look at itself from outside. You see, I thought we'd start on a high note. I used to ask myself, why? The rest of the industry hadn't caught up with First Direct. I mean, it's bloody obvious, isn't it? That if, if you look at the world from a customer's point of view, then you're going to be the one who looks at it from the queue in the branch, aren't you? And if you look at it from the queue in the branch, then a 24-7, 365 bank is obvious. And you scratch your head thinking, why didn't we think of that before? It's not like the telephone hasn't been around for a while. It's obvious, but it's no less and no more obvious than sticking wheels on a suitcase and attaching a handle. It's only obvious if you thought about it and if you lived it and remembered to. Our industry has an unhealthy and now, unfortunately, unnecessary self-obsession. We are genuinely enamored and interested in the complexity of what we do. We like it. We get off on the complexity of what we do. It's extraordinary. At First Direct, we're a bank, but we don't like banking. We don't like banking because our customers don't like banking. Banking is boring, but money is interesting. Our customers like money. Don't get the two confused. We are, as I like to now describe it, a non-banky bank. A non-banky bank. It is going to be a new advertising slogan for us. Already, I know where it's going to go in social media. How many times do we invent and reinvent who we are and what we do? How many people in our industry do you know who spend their time people watching 
And I'm not talking about the marketing agency or the research company that you engaged where you outsourced that problem to somebody else. I'm talking about you because you lead the industry. How many of you sit and spend a day people watching? You'd be amazed at what you can learn. And how many of you truly, truly think about the power of brands? You should have been raising your hands in pride to tell me that the bank you chose was a symbol of who you are. And unless and until you can, it's a race to the bottom. It's not a race that I want to partake in. So to be a new kind of bank, ladies and gentlemen, we do need to discover and to rediscover the power of brands. And to be a new kind of bank, we need to invent and we need to reinvent banking. And only then will we be ready to serve a new kind of customer. Have a great day.